Hello, Nutrition 115 students, and welcome to Unit 8 of Chapter 8, Calories, Food, Energy, and Energy Balance. So before we get into the discussion of what a calorie is, um, I want you to know that when you think of calories, um, do you think of energy? You should, because that's the way we measure energy from food, um, is in the form of calories. And this is the scientifically correct way to think about them. Energy is what calories are all about, right? Um, also, I want you to know that um, calorie is a unit of measurement. The calorie is like a centimeter or pound, in that it is a unit of measurement. And then rather than serving as a measure of length or weight, the calorie is used as a measure of energy. Specifically, a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, so about four cups, from 15 degrees Celsius to 16 degrees Celsius, or 59 degrees Fahrenheit to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I want to let you know that your textbook has an illustration, 8.1 illustration, um, and it has a picture of um, depicting how a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water uh, from uh, 15 degrees Celsius to 16 or 59 degrees Fahrenheit to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and sometimes in other textbooks we say the amount that it's needed to raise um, one kilogram of water at one degree Celsius or one degree Fahrenheit, okay? Now, the caloric value of food is determined in a bomb calorimeter. calorimeter. So there's an apparatus called a bomb calorimeter, and that is the apparatus that is used in the science field to determine the calories that a food contains. And a bomb calorimeter, um, how it determines the caloric value of food is by burning it completely in a container surrounded by a specific amount of water. And then illustration 8.2 in your book has a depiction of that. So um, on your slides, I went ahead and provided that information. A calorie is a unit of measure used to express the amount of energy produced by foods in the form of heat. And then in nutrition, the calories used in this field, um, I want you to know some of you might have seen like calorie as a big C, calorie as a small c and then also the kcal that you see here now k calories and calories with the big c are the same thing um, when you read nutrition food labels um, they're measured in calories with the big c which is the same thing as kilocalories now the reason for this bigger unit this bigger unit is because the way the scientists capture uh, a calorie in this form of heat from foods is in a small calorie See, and it's such a small unit that um, it wasn't able to be used um, in the field of nutrition um, in a user-friendly manner. So therefore, they um, were able to convert it to more of a bigger calorie or a kilocalorie in that manner. Okay, so it's more usable um, and user-friendly in the nutrition field. The term kilocalorie or calorie, like I said, uh, um, is the same thing as using the tech, is gradually being replaced. I also want you to know by kilojoule in the United States. So you can also know that um, in the scientific field, we have been using this term to um, convert small calories to kilocalories, but now we're starting to use uh, kilojoules just to make everything congruent. Now this is a image straight from your book. It's illustration 8.1, uh, depicting a little bit about um, how a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, about four cups, from 15 degrees Celsius to 16 degrees Celsius, or 59 degrees Fahrenheit to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. And I already told you this, so um, this is just an illustration of a bomb calorimeter, the apparatus that is used to um, um, put the food in this apparatus in order to uh, have it go through a scientific experiment. Um, and it's burned, again, in a specific amount of water, and then um, we're able to measure the amount of heat that that food is emitting, and we're able to measure it in calories, and then eventually we can make conversions to kilojoules and bigger calories. But I want you to know we are also um, finding that we now have apparatuses or these calorimeters that measure kilojoules directly when we're doing the study or the experiment. Now, a lot of you have heard the terms energy in equals energy out, but I want you to know that that is true, but a lot of us think of energy out as merely just exercising a lot and moving more physically, moving our bodies more, whether it's through daily tasks 
or through um, structured exercise. We forget also to think about there's other mechanisms in the body that help us expel or expend energy. And that includes not just physical activities, as you see here, but something called basal metabolism and the thermic effect of food. So basal metabolism is uh, the energy requiring processes that include the following breathing, energy used by your organs, just thinking, just breathing, just for merely living and having the systems running and uh, functioning properly, you need calories for that. So yes, you need calories to merely keep you alive, also calls your basal metabolism. And that accounts for about two thirds of your total calories in a day. And that can change depending if you're of bigger stature, bigger people need more calories to keep them alive than smaller people and what your body composition is, for example, if you have more muscle mass than fat mass. And then also your physical activities are second. And then lastly, the thermic effect of food, which is the amount of energy needed to basically digest, absorb, and transport foods and nutrients in your body, um, account for about 10% of your total calories a day, okay? Um, now, I also want you to know that basal metabolism can be measured, uh, can be estimated in your book. If you are a man, you can just multiply your pounds and weight by 11. And if you're a female in here, you can multiply your weight in pounds by 10, and that just gives you a rough estimate of what your basal metabolism is. It does not account for physical activity or the thermic effect of food, okay? Um, there also are clinical ways to get your basal metabolism tested. Some universities uh, that have uh, physio uh, physiology labs, like um, my undergrad um, college, California State University of Sacramento, they have a lab there where you can get your basal metabolism tested, but it requires a lot of rigorous guidelines and preparation for uh, the, the patient. So if we, and Kaiser Permanente too might have these facilities and other hospitals and clinics, but I want you to know they're pretty costly and it requires a lot of prep for uh, the client. You have to like have restful sleep, you have to fast and so on, okay? Um, according to your book, um, basal met metabolic rate is the rate at which energy is used by the body when it is at, is at complete rest. BMR is expressed as calories used per unit of time, such as an hour per unit of body weight in kilograms. And then an, um, also called resting metabolic rate or, or resting energy expenditure. Um, now, I want to let you know your book says that your Another term for basal metabolic rate is resting metabolic rate, but in other textbooks, that's not the case. In other textbooks, they say that a resting metabolic rate is different than a basal metabolic rate. And how so? So other textbooks will say that a resting metabolic rate is different. Um, it's about 6% higher. Um, the calories will be a little higher for that calculation because it's done in a non-fasting manner, so therefore you're going to require more calories at the end of the equation, whereas basal metabolic rate uh, is usually done in a fasting state clinically, okay? The body's need for energy. Basal metabolism, like I said, is used, energy is used to support body processes at complete rest, which again, I'm going to um, reiterate, it includes just to keep your heart rate pumping, your nervous system going, your lungs breathing, all those systems um, working properly at rest, okay? Energy for breathing, pumping of the heart, means of body temperature and other life-sustaining ongoing functions. Uh, again, the most modifiable um, energy expenditure component is physical activity. So you can actually, um, um, you can uh, make the decision, decision and be very willing to add more physical activity in your life. Again, it's the most controlled, the most modifiable if you're looking to change your energy expenditure. Dietary thermogenesis or the thermic effect of food is the energy expended during the digestion, absorption, storage, and transport of food and nutrients. So it requires energy. Three types of energy requiring processes. So I just want to let you know here is some imagery. So basal metabolism requires energy, physical activity requires energy, and so does dietary thermogenesis. 
those processes of digesting, absorbing, and transporting nutrients and food to your body. The body's need for energy continued. So again, the energy from food fuels body processes such as muscular activity and growth, tissue repair and maintenance, chemical processes, and body temperature. Now in your book, um, it lists again, um, this is a lot of reiteration, so you should do well in this part of the test. When I ask about what of the which of the following processes account for energy exponenture, it's basal metabolism, physical activity, and the thermic effect of food or dietary thermogenesis. And your book has the definitions in there as well. Again, basal metabolic rate expressed as calories used per unit of time per unit of body weight. I said this before. Also called resting metabolic rate or resting energy exponential. And I also want you to rewind this YouTube because I also um, expressed how RMR is different from BMR in some other textbooks, especially those kinesiology textbooks. And um, I indicated earlier there is a way to, um, in clinical settings or in universities that have physio physiology labs to measure your basal metabolic rate, which is very accurate compared to calculations. Um, just mere calculations without the clinical facilities. Um, but again, you're going to go through some rigorous preparation. And it's a clinical method um, used to measure BMR. We call it indirect calorimet calorimetry in humans. So how much energy do I expend for basal metabolism? I said this before. If you want a rough estimate, um, take your body weight if you're a man in here, times it by 11. If you're a woman, take your body weight in pounds and times it by uh, 10, and then you'll get your um, estimate BMR calories that you need just to sustain you at rest. And then it, again, it varies uh, plus or minus 10 to 20% of the actual calories. So this rough estimate calculation is about 10 to 20% off the actual, that if you were to do it in a clinical facility the right way. And it gives, uh, this can change because it depends on physical activity, muscle mass, height, health status, genetic traits. And I want to also point out that muscle mass is a lot more active at rest compared to fat. So if you've ever studied a fat cell versus a muscle cell, you'll find that the muscle cell is extremely active at rest where the fat, uh, fat cell is not. So it does require more energy to sustain um, muscle mass at rest because muscle is more active or lean tissue is more active than non-lean tissue like fat. So how much energy do you expend in physical activity? I want you to know the caloric level needed for physical activity can vary a lot. Depending on how active a person is, it usually accounts for the second highest amount of calories we expend, as you saw in that pie chart. Now, the energy cost of supporting a physically active lifestyle, um, physically inactive lifestyle, is in table 8.2 in your book, as you see here. So um, it's just depicting the energy exponential by usual level of activity, usually for people that are physically inactive, okay? So um, this table says is about 30% of the number of calories needed for basal metabolism. An average activity level person requires about roughly about 50% of the calories needed for basal metabolism, and an active person level requires approximately 75%, okay? Um, now, a physically inactive person needing 1,500 calories a day for their basal metabolism, for example, would require about 450 calories. And here's an example. So if they ate a total of 1,500 calories, you would times that by 30% based on this table because they're inactive, sitting most of the day, less than two hours of moving about slowly or standing. So when you um, take 30% of 1,500 calories, that's 450 calories total for physical activity, okay? How many total calories daily? Now, calories expended for dietary thermogenesis or the thermic effect of it are estimated at 10% of the sum of basal metabolic and usual physical calories. Here's an example. So 1,500 calories needed for basal metabolic need. And I mentioned before, um, 450 calories is the estimate for an inactive person if we do the 
and then 1,500 calories uh, plus 450 equals 1,950 uh, calories. Dietary thermogenesis is about 10%. So some of you can do this in your head. 10% of 1,950 is 195 calories that would be required for the dietary thermogenesis of food. Estimated total daily calorie needs, therefore, would be 2145, 2145 calories. So you would take um, 1500 calories for basal metabolic needs plus the 450 calories that are needed for physical activity plus the 195 calories that are needed for dietary thermogenesis. So this is an estimate. Again, you can get this done in the clinical facility, but it'll be very costly and rigorous. Calculations for estimating total calories. So your book has a summary of calculations for estimating total calorie need of 130 pound inactive woman. So it also performs some calculations there for you. Again, if you need another example, if you didn't maybe quite get the, um, the last slide. So you have two examples, one in your book and then one in my slide. Now, um, we're gonna talk about the energy and foods next. So where's the energy in foods? I want to remind you guys that we learned about physiological values earlier in the semester. And we learned that for every gram of carb you eat, you get four calories. For every gram of protein you eat, you get four calories. And for every gram of fat you eat, you get nine calories. So fats are a concentrated form of energy. And you can use the nutrition facts panel or the food labels to perform calculations. For example, if I asked you to pull out a packaged granola bar from your backpack, it would say something like you get 20 grams of carbs if you ate that granola bar. So you would take 20 and times it by 4 in order to get how many calories you would be getting from those 20 grams of carbohydrates. So some of you can do this in your head, but if you take 20 and times it by 4, that would be 80 calories. Okay. And then alcohol is not an essential nutrient, but I just want to say if you do drink alcohol, it does provide energy, 7 calories per gram. Now, any food that contains carbs, carbohydrates, proteins, or fats, the energy nutrients, remember that, supplies the body with energy. So I want to remind you of that. And then um, table 8.4 in your book includes uh, the foods listed. Um, so if you want to take a look at that. Now, um, let's go on to learn a little bit more. So energy in food. So if you have observed the flames produced by fat dripping from a steak or a hamburger on a grill, a lot of us are grilling right now this year around, you have seen the powerhouse of energy stored in fat. The carbohydrate and protein contents of grilled foods don't burn with nearly the same intensity. They have less energy to give. Okay, so if you enjoy grilling foods on an outdoor barbecue, you have probably observed again firsthand the high level of stored energy and fats. And I just gave you this example. Okay, now um, your book has calculations also. Um, I did one for you. I talked about the packaged granola bar. But if you need more examples of how to convert these physiological values to calories, um, chapter this chapter in your book chapter 8 has a calculation so here um, when I look at your book it says that if you ate 15 grams of carbs you times it by 4 you get 60 calories if a food contains 10 grams of protein you times it by 4 you get 40 calories and if that same food contains 5 grams of fat you times it by 9 you get 45 calories therefore that food um, has components of carbs proteins and fats has a total of 145 calories. So a lot of the calories on your nutrition facts kind of or your food labels is a, is a mathematical equation based on the grams of proteins, grams of fats, and gram, grams of carbohydrates. Now some of you might carry out these um, calculations on your food label and say why is the calories a little different. Sometimes they um, vary the calories if it has a lot of fiber or a little bit of fiber because fiber does interact um, with the caloric uh, needs, um, with the caloric availability, I should say, that the, that the, of the body. So fiber may impede a little bit of the calorie or the nutrient um, uh, accessibility of our body because it's um, kind of a barrier, okay? 
Now, given this information about the caloric value of carbs, proteins, and fats, which of the following would you expect to be highest in calories? So let's go on to the next slide. So I'm asking you, again, which of these foods do you think contains uh, the most calories? A tablespoon of margarine, sugar, or pork? Now about half of the students get, get this incorrect. There are about 104 calories in one tablespoon of margarine, 46 calories in a tablespoon of sugar, and 40 calories um, of relatively lean pork. Okay, so this is lean pork. So it would be the margarine with 101 calories. Okay. Now here's another example from your book. So it's the example that I was talking about. It's telling you how you can um, use the physiological values of macronutrients to determine how many calories you're getting when you read nutrition facts panel or nutrition or food labels to determine how many calories you're getting from those grams. So let's say that you bought a soup, a canned soup, and it said on the label that for one cup of that soup, you'll get 15 grams of carbs. 10 grams of protein and five grams of fat. You would merely take the physiological values of each macronutrient, or like it's four calories per gram for carbs, four calories per gram for protein, and nine calories per gram for fat. You would times it, and you'll get the total calories that you're getting from those grams. Then when you add all three together, you'll get a total of 145 calories for that one cup of soup. Now, if you wanted to go further and you wanted to decide what percentage of the soup was carbs, protein, and fats, you can do the following by using the total calories. So you would take um, 60 calories of carbohydrates divided by the total, 145, times it by 100, that's 41%. And then for protein, it was 40 calories divided by the total, 145, times it by 0.28, and also by 100 to get the percentage 28. And then so on with fat. Fat was 45 calories. You can divide it by 145 and then times it by 0 0.31 and then by 100 to get the percentage. So for some of you, your um, calculators, you don't have to perform that extra step of times it by 100. You can just put percentage. Um, but nonetheless, um, just to do it properly, you can do it this way. So it means here that that can of soup is 41% carbs, 28% protein, and 31% Fat. Okay. So most foods I want you to know are mixtures of proteins, fats, and carbs. Did you know that even meats, even though they're mainly protein and fats, um, they do have very little trace amounts of carbohydrates. So um, they're almost purely uh, protein and fats, um, depending on what part of the animal it is. But you will also find trace amounts of carbohydrates as well. Okay, so again, food is a mixture of um, macronutrients. Uh, some foods, such as oil and table sugar, for instance, consist, <coughs> excuse me, consist almost exclusively, exclusively of one energy nutrient. But again, uh, most foods are a combination of protein, carbs, and fat. You may have trace amounts. Um, let's take bread, for example. Bread is high in complex carbs or starch. So it has a lot of carbs, but it also contains protein and a very, very small amount of fat. Um, bread would not be considered a good source of protein, especially if it's refined, um, but you can get some little amounts of protein from it. Again, they're mixtures of macronutrients. Now, what's the caloric value of these foods? So can you guess which one contains 420 calories, which one contains 205? And which one is 118? You can pause it and guess. Now I'm going to reveal the answers here. So a half a cup of peanuts is the 420 calories. The one medium potato uh, boils is 118 calories. And a cup of white rice is 205 calories. So the medium potato would be the least calories, followed by the cup of rice and then the half a cup of peanuts. So here you go, here's one. I actually put the numbers in there. So one, uh, 420 calories, two, 205, and third is 118. 
Now, most of us think of energy-dense foods as unhealthy foods, such as meat and carbohydrates that are refined, like fries, okay? But I want you to know the energy-dense foods or measuring energy density um, applies to any food. You can also compare the energy density within uh, the same foods. For example, a, um, a grilled chicken breast would be less energy dense than a um, fried uh, drumstick, okay? Um, fruits and vegetables, as far as categories and food groups, fruits and vegetables tend to be the less energy dense, whereas more like the protein group, mm, I would say not the protein group in general because it has some subgroups like beans and legumes, and those are very, can be very low energy dense, but um, some of the energy dense foods we can find in the protein group, some of them, and then also in the grain group, but mostly the fruit and vegetable group are lower as far as energy density. Now, what is energy density? Um, also known as calorie density is the number of calories per gram of food. So for every gram, the way we're looking to see how much um, calories they're packing on. And then as you guys saw, nuts can be pretty energy dense, okay? Even though they're considered healthy, somewhat healthy, usually a handful is all you need to get the benefits. They can pack on a lot of energy per gram. So it's calculated by dividing the number of calories in a portion of food by the food's weight in grams or calculated as calories per, per 100 grams of food. So here's an example. 170 calories in 20 grams of potato chips. So you take 170 calories divided by 20 grams, you get 5.4 calories per gram to know how much you're getting per gram. Okay, you divide it. So energy density continued. U.S. diets are high in energy dense foods associated with overeating, weight gain, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. Um, a lot of studies are finding that we eat a lot of grains in the form of refined grains like potato chips. Um, you know, they're not really in their natural form. They're really refined and white. And we need to switch more to like whole grains, uh, breads and pastas, okay, um, that contain much more fiber and natural nutrients. Energy dense foods tend to be, again, nutrient poor. Nutrient-rich foods, however, are usually your fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean meats. They're usually low in energy density, okay? They're associated with favorable nutrient intake and reduced weight gain. Usually nutrient-rich foods, um, they're called nutrient-rich foods or low um, energy-dense foods. They're usually um, not only low in calories, but they pack on a lot of nutrients per gram as well. So they'll have a lot of vitamins and minerals. Health action, moving towards foods lower in energy density. So your book has a nice little table here called the health action um, segment. And it lists some higher energy dense foods and their calories uh, per gram that they weigh and how you can choose on the right side um, a better version of it in order to decrease your calories per gram. For example, it says here, if you like frozen sweetened strawberries, it packs on 1.1 calories per gram. You can choose fresh strawberries, which um, give you 0.3 calories per gram. And if you like hash brown potatoes, you can substitute them for boiled potato instead. So how are food and energy intake regulated by the body? We're going to talk about um, some physiological processes. Hunger. Okay, we usually tell, uh, refer to hunger as a physiological drive so there's a lot of um, hormonal effects that happen in the body physiologically it's a basic human need so no matter um, how thin um, or how big a person is it uh, does not matter shape or size she or he experiences hunger and again this physiological drive to eat food and if food is not consumed several times throughout the day the hungry signal is initiated and it's thought to be sent again by a series of complex mechanisms um, when cells run low on energy, nutrients supplied by the last meal of a snack. And sometimes hunger will also change your appetite. Like if you didn't have an appetite for a certain type of food, you might all of a sudden get it, get it. And again, hunger is a physiological drive, whereas appetite is more psychological. Okay, it's more of a um, hedonistic 
or pleasure mechanism driven by flavor or pleasure of food, okay? So unpleasant physical and psychological sensations, weakness, stomach pain, irritability get us to eat. Uh, but again, we also say it's a physiological drive uh, because there's physiological processes that happen to initiate you to eat right away because it's a basic human need. Satiety. Okay, let's talk about what satiety is. Satiety is um, after you've eaten a meal and from the time you get hungry again to eat the next meal as nutrients get um, depleted, um, that's called satiety. And there's a lot of research going on about, you know, what foods can you eat um, for a meal so that after you're finished eating them, it takes you longer uh, and you don't feel as hungry throughout the day. So they're basically studying satiety. So satiety is how long will it take you to get hungry again from one meal to the next, okay? Satiable is different. If you ever said, I feel satiable during a meal, that accounts more for during a meal. So it's about what are you doing during a meal, the components that you're eating, the nutrients that you're eating, the tactics that you're applying during a meal that make you feel full during a meal. So that's satiable. Satiable and satiety, again, are not the same. You can go ahead and rewind it if you want to um, listen to uh, the definitions of both again, okay? So it's a feeling of fullness or having had enough to eat. And again, and also it measures how long it'll take you to eat until the next meal. Appetite is a desire to eat, a pleasant sensation that is aroused by thoughts, taste, and enjoyment of food. We call that more of a psychological need because um, there's really not a lot of physiological things that are going on as far as like you have to eat this thing or you will not function properly. Um, it does feel like that sometimes, but it's more of a, uh, we call it psychological when we studied it. Whereas hunger is more physiological, even though it says physical and psychological sensations, but these physiological processes, hormonal changes, these cascade effects are causing also psychological feelings. The question of energy balance. Okay, let's talk about the first law of thermodynamics. So you have heard of it. So energy balance is the number of calories used equals the number of calories consumed. Weight is maintained. Okay, now again, there's um, we learned about energy expenditure. So we can expend energy through basal metabolism, through um, physical activity, through the thermal genesis of food, the thermic effect of food, and there's different components with each, each category that can also change. For example, basal metabolism can change if you uh, gain more muscle mass, you'll be more active at rest because muscle is more active, okay? If you decide to add a day of jogging, you're going to start expending more energy throughout the week, okay, physically. Uh, negative energy balance is when energy intake, so what you put in your body, uh, the calories that you put in is less than the amount of calories that you expend out, you'll experience weight loss. Positive energy balance, which athletes, I want you to note this because I'm not sure if it's in your book, but athletes can benefit from positive energy balance, especially when they have a high volume training, and also pregnant women. Okay, and people that are about to go into major surgery as well, they're going to lose a lot of protein in the process of the surgery. So they can benefit from being positive going into the surgery. So more energy is available from foods than is needed by the body and weight is gained. Okay. Normal during childhood, growth, pregnancy, or regaining weight following an illness. Like I said, like if you're going to have surgery or major uh, for a traumatic event like open heart surgery, or my mother recently had um, small intestinal surgery, which was um, a lot on her body, and she lost a lot of protein, and actually she lost a lot of weight, um, and she's gaining her weight back um, normally and health healthfully. We're proud of her. So energy balance, um, here's just a, an example. So uh, for those of you that like images, um, energy intake, um, is less than energy needed. It results in weight loss. We call that negative energy balance. Also, a lot of third world countries, a lot of children are in negative energy balance due to malnutrition and poor food sources and poor water sources as well. 
you're an energy balance if your energy intake equals energy a need. Um, so this results in maintenance of your weight or health. Positive energy balance, again, is when your intake is more than what you output or expend out. Keep calories in perspective. Okay, I kind of hesitate to say that title because I don't want people to be obsessed with counting calories, but it is good to um, maybe do a checkup here and there. Okay, calorie is not a word that means fat mean or bad for you. Again, we all need calories, all different shapes and sizes to keep us alive and to sustain us, to keep us working properly and functioning properly. Calories represent our source of energy and are a life and health sustaining property of food, like I just um, explained and stated. Caloric content of individual foods does not make a food uh, good or bad. Um, and I also uh, want to encourage you to take our food and culture course that we offer here at DDC. You'll learn a lot about different cultures and ethnic groups and how they see food differently. The sum of calories and nutrients in foods make up our dietary pattern. 